And I looked beyond that and I saw those cooling towers. I didn't know what that was about. Freaked me out a little bit when I first saw it. But then I just saw this vast area and I thought, wow, can, can I imagine this full of dead dry bones? And it had a real impact on me because when I, when I see this in Scripture and I don't know specifically how big this valley was, but I know the valley in which we live is pretty big. And to imagine that they were full of dry bones and, and Ezekiel was set down in the middle of it. He put, him, he put him in the middle of the dry bones, verse 1 says. And I love what he says in verse 2 because I think this is important. So first of all, he says it's full of dry bones. So he had these dry bones, but it was full. And then he led me around in them. There were a great many of them on the surface of the valley, and they were very dry. Very dry. What, what, what's the point there? Right, it's, skeleton's a skeleton's a skeleton, right? I mean, it's dead. But, but the emphasis on here is it was very dry. These bones had been here. They had been bleached by the sun. There was absolutely no sense of hope that anything was going to happen. And so it's like God said, look, I'm going to put these bones out here, and I want you to see that they have been here for a long time. There has been no life in these bones for a very long time. So they're dry. They're, they're whitened even more by the dryness of the sun beating down on them. And, and you think about this, because you know, you've heard the story, you heard it just a minute ago, God's got a point to make. And I keep thinking, you know what? Just one skeleton probably would have done it, don't you think? I, I mean, if you just got one dead guy out there who's been dead or they're excavating and then there's this body that's found and you think, God's going to do something with that. Why don't you just do it with the skeleton? I mean, that would prove a point. But if God's going to do something in such a way that he puts an entire valley full of dry bones, it makes an impact. And can you imagine Ezekiel as he's just kind of wandering through? At this point, doesn't, doesn't know what God's doing. He's just He's just kind of wandering around and looking, and maybe he's having to, to step over a bone so he doesn't so he didn't step on it, and he's just covered, and as far as he can see, he just sees death. He just sees hopelessness. It's just, man, there's nothing here but death and decay. And you, you have to wonder, man, what were the lives like? What, 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 what would this have been? Why all of these bones? What, what lives did they live? Because each bone represented the part of a body that represented a, a, a human created in the image of God. And Ezekiel's just looking at it. And so it's interesting, while he's walking around, he's looking at it, trying to figure out what, what's going on here? What are you doing, God? And God then asks him a question. And he says, and again, picture yourself. You're in the midst of all of this. And he asks the simple question, can these bones live? And you're looking around, and, and the obvious answer you'd kind of come up with was, heck no. Like, it's, it's just dry bones. There's no life here. And yet, Ezekiel says something different. Because this is not a trick question. It's a clarifying question. It's not that God is asking Ezekiel, do I have the power or do you have the faith? God knew the answer of both, but this was a clarifying question for Ezekiel. And Ezekiel's response is interesting here where he says in verse 3, Lord God, you know, which is to say, Lord God, only you know. You are the one who has this information. He's not being flippant, I don't believe. It's not like, whoop, God knows. Or God only knows. <laughs> it's not that kind of a response. It's, it's, it's acknowledging that only God has this kind of power. Ezekiel knows that it is beyond himself or anyone. Ezekiel knows that unless God does something, there is no hope, but that there is hope with the one who knows all things and is all powerful to be able to accomplish all that he intends to do. 
And at the same time, I think it's a test of faith. Does Ezekiel truly believe that God really knows and that if God commands them to live, that they can live? The real test, though, is about to come. So there's the question of, do you believe? And I think that if I asked you the same question, and we're up on top of Lookout Mountain, and there was a valley of dry bones, and I said, hey, do you believe that God can make all these things live? What would you say? Sure. Sure he can. And that's what I'd say. Sure he can make these live. He's all-powerful. He can do whatever he wants. He created them. He can recreate them. I would say that without hesitation. But that's not the real test here. Because in verses 4 through 6, God gives a command. He said to me, prophesy concerning these dry bones. In other words, preach at them. Talk to them. Proclaim to them. He says, prophesy concerning these dry bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord God says to these bones. I will cause breath to enter you and you will live. I'll put tendons on you, make flesh grow on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you so that you come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. On the surface, I think this is kind of ridiculous sounding, right? It's like saying, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get in your car. I want you to go down the road. and I want you to go to 153 to Hamilton Gardens uh, Cemetery there. I want you to get out of your car And I want you to start preaching to everybody who's present. And nobody's present. But I want you to say, dry bones, dead bones, you graves here. God's going to make you live. And you just think, that's crazy. That's that's ridiculous. Am I Why would you say this to me? And here's where that crisis of belief is. Does Ezekiel think through these things and say, God, I believe you can do it. Why do you need to preach at them? The crisis of belief comes when we're actually told to do something that reaffirms our belief. It's one thing for Ezekiel to say, yes, I believe you can, but it's a very different thing to say, you've said it, so I believe you will. I believe you will do it? Does he question God's command? Does he doubt God's power when it comes right down to it? Does he doubt that anything's going to happen at all? Does he prioritize his desire not to look dumb? Or does he just obey and leave the results to God? Is that really what he's saying when he says, God, you know. So if you say it, then I'm going to believe it, and because I believe it, I'm going to do it. And so what did Ezekiel do here? He starts preaching, and he just starts proclaiming. He says everything that God tells him to do. He just obeyed. And here's the, the, the thing about this. If he does nothing at this point, nothing happens. If Ezekiel does nothing, then at this point, nothing happens. See, Ezekiel's obedience is part of God's process here. God has, and make no mistake about it, God has the power to do whatever he wants with whomever he wants or with no one. God did not need Ezekiel to proclaim to the bones to live in order for the for the for them to live. It was nothing that Ezekiel added to God to make this happen. It is just that God had ordained that this was the process through which he wanted to fulfill his purpose. God was going to uh, fulfill his promise to Abraham one way or the other, but he has conditioned this particular action based on the obedience of his servant. And here is where we get to see what Ezekiel really believes. And so verse 7, he does it. He said, so I prophesied as I had been commanded. While I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the the bones came together. You heard it. It it just all, all starts fastening together. But here's the point that I want you to see here. I want you to understand what the words say here. He said, he said, so I So I prophesied as I had been commanded. And what are the next three words? 
while I was, and then there's a fourth word, prophesying. While I was prophesying, as I started to prophesy, then it all started to happen. As he prophesied, the, bo the bones began to reassemble so that they, covered, they were covered with flesh. It was not until Ezekiel took action that God chose to move in response. It was not until he took action. So, so it's like, I think the easy thing would be for God to say, okay, I want you to prophesy that these things start coming together. And it would be really helpful and really encouraging if you started hearing something rattle, just a little bit. I don't need a lot. Just, just throw me a bone, would you? <laughs> just, it starts rattling. Yeah, I know, I heard the collective, uh-huh. The bones start rattling, and I can go, Okay, okay, yes, I'm, I'm, you're working with me now. So here's what God says, and you start preaching. But, but here's the thing, he didn't, have, he didn't hear a thing. I would imagine he heard absolute silence. But as he started, prophet, as he was obedient, after obedience came action. I think there's something really important for us to, listen, to, to learn there. Are you going to wait to get some sort of a response from God, some sort of a hint for, for God to throw you a bone in order for you to do something that he has called you to do? Or do you really believe enough to step out on faith and do it even if it absolutely looks and sounds ridiculous? God says, you do it and then I will respond. But in verse eight, there's something interesting here, I think. Verse 8, he said, As I looked, tendons appeared on them, flesh grew, skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. I thought that was interesting. So there was two parts here. So he, he, gives the, he starts prophesying. The bones all come together. So now what we have, I'm not sure if this is better or worse. Because now instead of a bunch of dry bones, you just got a bunch of dead people laying everywhere. For me, a little freakier, to be honest with you. I can deal, so I've been to, to the catacombs in different places in church. We went to one in Lima. Some of you might have been with us. And you just saw these skulls everywhere. There were bones all over. There were, they estimated there were like 2,000 people. Their bones were in there. And I kind of walk in there, and I'm thinking, all right, all right, you know, this is, this is interesting. It's, it's nothing real freaky. But put me in a morgue that has that many people, I'm a little freaked out. Got to be honest with you. And so now he's got a valley full of people that have no life in them, that, that, that aren't breathing. And so verse eight, uh, uh, 8 there, but there was no breath. And so verse 9 then, he told me to prophesy. Now the thing about this, and the thing about this, this valley full of dead bodies that I think we need to understand is, I think a lot of times, we can see people in our lives around us who look pretty whole. I mean, we're not looking at a bunch of dead people lying down, but I think in our world around us, we can see a bunch of dead people walking around. And so though a person shows signs of the work of God in their lives, they know the right lingo, they know the right words, man, they're, they're, they seem to be living a pretty good life, they seem to be basically good. We can jump to the assumption that they're okay, that there's life in them. But here's the thing, even though these bodies were now put together, there was still no breath of life in them. And so we can't stop ministering to people and sharing the, the gospel when they begin to look the part because there is a process in this. We have to ask, has God given signs of life? And if they talk the right talk and they act a certain way, that doesn't necessarily mean that they've come to trust in Jesus. But I want you to notice that in every single part of this, or both parts, two parts here, that in each of these parts, Ezekiel had a role to play. That God had a role for Ezekiel to play in both proclaiming what God was going to do and then prophesying that the breath of God would come into them. And that's where he went next. So he had in verse 9 a new command. He says, now prophesy to the breath. In other words, declare the Lord's command that breath come into them. And then verse 10, here we, is, here we are again. As he 
obeyed, breath came into them. They stood and were a vast army. So again, let's get the picture. Before he prophesied here, before he obeyed, there were flesh-covered corpses, but they were still corpses. So Ezekiel was in the middle of a process of God's work, and it was going to take absolute obedience at every step of the way without losing heart or resolve. And I want you to hear that. It requires for us to be about God's work in the same way that Ezekiel was. We have to be involved and committed every step of the way through God's process without losing heart. And, and i got to be honest with you, sometimes that's hard to do. I, Karen and I were talking this morning. She's home with Andrew who's sick. But we were talking this morning about uh, some um, ministry that I've been trying to do with certain people within our community. And it's been going on for a year and this morning she said, hey, how's that going? I said, you know what? I don't think it's going so well. I just don't, I don't, I'm not getting a lot of feedback. I'm not getting a lot of activity. And so I, I told her, I heard this come out of my mouth. I said, I think I've lost heart. I think I've lost my heart for this. And as I, as I think about this and, and, I, and I reflect on that, how easy it is when God doesn't act in our timing and when we think that he should and when we we put ourselves out there and we put ourselves out there and we put ourselves out there and it just seems like nothing comes back. It's so easy to lose heart. But that's when we have to remember, you know what God calls us to? It's not results. God calls us to obedience. And you just keep doing it and you keep doing it. So if, if Ezekiel had prophesied to the bones, and what would have happened if or to the corpses. What, what would happen if he, had, if he had proclaimed that and nothing happened then? What would have happened then? Here's my hope. I hope Ezekiel would have just kept preaching. I hope Ezekiel would have just kept at it because he believed, because he trusted God for who he was. Because God's timing is not always our timing, is it? We're, we're this kind, you know, we're Americans, man. It's like we got smartphones and we got, man, we're gig city here. You, you put something in the internet, you're looking at Google or something, you want your results like that, right? That's what we want. That's what we've come to expect. Because EPB is supposed to work on our timing. And if they don't, what do we do? Excuse me. It, it took me 10 seconds to get my information. Excuse me, how are we Gig City if I can't get my information when I put it in? What, what's happening here to your service if you don't come and respond to the, that's what we do. And here's the problem. A lot of times we project that right onto God. We expect God to be God, gig God, right? So it's like, we're like, God, here's what I am doing and I expect results right now. And God says, let's think about this. Let's think about this again. Who exactly is God again? Which one of us is God? Remember the story of Job? What happened? Job went through this whole process. A horrible story. That's, that's another sermon. But in the end, when Job was declaring his righteousness, which he was, I mean, it's not that he had done anything wrong. But God needed to say, hey, Job, I am God. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? Where were you when I stopped the oceans at the beach there? Where were you when all of this came about? Which one of us is God? And Job said, I spoke before and now I'm silent. I had heard of you with my ears now I've seen you with my eyes and now I know that you are God and that's the attitude that we need to take when God calls us to something that we're persistent in it remembering that he is God and that we are not so he obeyed and God completed his work through the process and then he gives an interpretation to him in 11 through 14 I want you to see this so God tells Ezekiel what this means verse 11 he said to me, son of man, these bones are the, the whole house of Israel. Look how they say our bones are dried up and our hope has perished. We are cut off. Therefore, in much the same way, that is to say, prophesy and say to them, this is what the Lord God says. I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them, my people, and lead you into the land of Israel. You will know that I am the Lord, my people, when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it. This is the declaration of the Lord. Ezekiel had already seen an example 
of God speaking and then him doing it. He got to see God do this in a, in a show and tell kind of illustration here. And now he's saying, Ezekiel, what you've seen, I want you to proclaim to Israel that I will do this for you, that I have called you from this. And so in this vision, God demonstrates who he is. He's compassionate. He's long-suffering. He's forgiving, and he's faithful. He's the God who makes all things new, breathing life into the dead, redeeming souls and giving hope through his power, through the power that only he has which is on full display in this text. So from beginning to end, Scripture is about the plan of God. When we look at Scripture, all the way from the start, all the way to the end of Revelation, it is about the redemptive plan of God. It's about His desire and His determination to establish for Himself a people from every tribe, nation, tongue throughout the world. And He chose Israel to be His special people through whom salvation would come. He promised to bless them and to be their God so long as they were faithful to him. And time and time again, they demonstrated their inability to do just that. That was the thing. If you follow me, I will bless you. If I'm your God, you'll be my people. But that's the covenant. And so they failed to do that over and over and over again. Yet God was faithful. He was not going to give up on his redemptive plan. And he was determined to use this particular people so that all the nations of the earth could be blessed. And God fulfilled his promise by by sustaining this people and sending a Messiah through them. That was his purpose. That's the connection that we have with this people. God kept his promise in Jesus who became the substitutionary sacrifice for all of us who have gone astray, all of us who have rebelled against him in much the same way that Israel did. It's not like that we're better than them. We're all in the same boat. We all need a Savior. Every single, Jews and Gentiles, all of us, we need a Savior. And that's what was demonstrated, that only God can give life. And so I want to say to you, if you're here today, And you're trying in some way to save yourself. You're trying in some way to be good enough. The bad news is you can't be. You won't be. The good news is Jesus was and he is. And then it's through trusting in him, Jews and Gentiles alike, that we come to know Jesus, that we come to live, that we get the breath in us. After making purifications for sin, Hebrews 1, 3 tells us, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. But he sent the Holy Spirit to establish the church, to carry out a mission of taking the good news throughout the world, to prophesy, if you will, to the dead bones, the life-giving words of the gospel. And we're a part of that church. Our local expression of God, of Christ's body is we're a part of that universal church that he established that we read about in the first part of Acts. We're a part of that church. The calling is ours. The question is, what are we going to do with it? What are we going to do about this? I think in much the same way we experience the same crisis of belief that Ezekiel did. Because we too are living in a valley of dry bones people who are dead all around us, even though they're covered with skin and they breathe, breathe oxygen like we do, yet they're spiritually dead. They're deprived of the life-giving breath of the Spirit that leads to life. They've got flesh and blood, but no life in their souls. They are, like Paul said in Ephesians 2.1, dead in their trespasses. I don't know if any of you watch this. Don't, don't admit it if you do. I mean, I, you know, whatever. Um, on AMC, it's The Walking Dead. Yeah, I don't know if you're laughing because you watch it or you're laughing because I brought it up. I'm not sure which it is. But the thing, there's so many people who are fascinated about this. It's like they're watching these zombies walk around and the zombies are all after them, you know, dragging the leg. They always have a leg problem. You notice that? Zombies always have a leg problem. Their arms can work fine. Their one leg at least is not working right. So they're dragging all over the place and they're coming after you. So there's this fascination. We, we see that. And here's what I wish. I, I don't really, so I'm just using it as, a, I don't really want to see this. But if we could see, 
if we could see the souls of people walking around us, I think we would be horrified if, as, as we looked on the decay and the death and the lifelessness in the eyes and the brokenness of the body. If we could just see reality, if we could see as God sees, and we, we didn't look at the exterior, but we could look at the soul. It's like, you know, you, you, maybe you've ever seen this, people who've smoked their whole life, and then they show you a picture of a lung that's a result of somebody who smoked their whole life. It's like you're going, ah, they look so good on the outside, but oh my goodness, right? If we could just see the reality then I wonder if it would change us. I wonder if it would make a difference to us. So the question echoes through the ages to us as we look around at the Tennessee River Valley full of dry bones. Church, can these bones live? Church, as you walk around through the valley, because you do it every day, you're walking around through the valley of dry bones. Can these bones live that are all around us? It's a question I think we need to ask. It's a question we too frequently ask. We too infrequently ask. We don't look because we just see the exterior that looks so good and we don't look to what's inside. And I think it's an easy answer for us like it was for Ezekiel. Less, yes, Lord, you can do anything. You can make them live as you made us live. And we sing about it every week. We, we preach about it. We talk about it in small groups and Bible studies. We believe this stuff. We, we say it. We absolutely believe that God can bring an awakening to this valley if he so chooses. But that's not the crisis of belief. That's not the crisis of belief that we face. The crisis comes when God says to us, prophesy to these bones then okay so church do you believe that god because i'm gonna I'm, I'm not preaching at you i'm preaching at us man i'm telling you this is a hard one i get it but he's saying to us church do you believe that these bones around you can live the crisis of belief comes when he says then prophesy to them then reach out and share with them the love of God. Then reach out and minister to them. That's a crisis of belief. And that's hard. I, and I do get that. But we are called to do something. Not just believe something. And that's where everything changes. It's one thing to believe that God can give life to the lifeless, that he can soften the hardened heart, but it's a very different thing for us to walk out into the spiritual cemetery and begin to proclaim the good news to the dry bones, bones that seem to be getting drier and drier, drier every year, I might add, as we look on the news and we listen to people who seem to be more resistant than ever to the gospel, more resistant to uh, what, anybody, what any Christian has to say. It seems as though it is impossible for some people to change. They're just too dry. They're just too hardened. They're just too set in their ways. People are just more resistant in this, in this post-Christian world. They're more suspicious of religion. So we, we need to be really honest with this when we ask ourselves two very important questions. Really honest. We're not here to play church. We need to ask these questions. The first question is, do, you, do we believe that the gospel can make these dead souls live? Do we really believe what Paul said about the gospel in Romans 1 is the power of salvation to those who believe? Do we believe this? And the second question is, do we really care? really. The, the, te the test of faith for Ezekiel was in two parts. He said, do you believe and then, do you, and then prophesy? The real crisis of belief only came when he was challenged to do something. And I think it's important that we ask the question of ourselves, if we believe that God can save people, but then if we do nothing in response, I wonder if that declaration of belief is worth anything. James didn't think, seem to think so. He said, faith without works is dead. 
He said we demonstrate our faith by, by what we do as a result of what we say we believe. So if we say we believe God can, but we don't act as if God will, then it makes me wonder if we believe that he can at all. And I'm afraid it says more about us than it does, or at least as much about us as it does with others, about others. And I think if we're honest, our attitude is that as soon as God brings people through our doors, we're going to love them and minister to them. Well, we're good at that. We really are. I mean, when, pe when people come into this place, we, we come around them and we, we want to get to know them. We, we minister to them. We, try, we take care of their needs. We try to take care of them physically and spiritually and emotionally. We want to do all of that. But the question is, is that enough? Is, is that what we're called to? And can't we just wait for God to pour out his spirit and, and cause people to begin seeking him when he's ready? Then we welcome him in and we start to minister to them. Isn't that, isn't that enough? Well, God certainly can. He can do that. But apparently that's not his desire. So look with me at Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verses 13 through 17. He said, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Truth, right there. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then, Paul says, can they call on him they have not believed in? And how can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they're sent? It is, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all obeyed, all, all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the message about Christ. So how are they going to hear without a preacher? And he ain't talking about just me. He's talking about us. He's talking about you and me, we, we are all called as ministers, commissioned and equipped to take the good news to the dead in the valley. And I know that this probably terrifies many of you. This may terrify most of you. Could terrify all of you. I'm not sure. But yet we are given some, some assurances, and, and I want to focus on two right here. That as we are called to go, as we are called to, to prophesy to the dead bones around us, to the people in our neighborhoods, to the people that we work with, number one, we have the power of Christ that does the work. It's the power of Jesus that does the work. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, you were dead. You were the walking zombies who drug your legs. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously lived according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. But skip to verse 4. He says, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. So in the middle, it tells us why of that verse. It tells us why. He did this because of his great love that he has for us. But take that little parenthetical phrase that it says, but God made us alive. So it is Jesus who made us alive. It is God who made us alive. The flesh doesn't help at all, the word tells us. It's not the flesh, it's God. It's the power of Christ that does this. We are saved by grace. And of course, he goes on to say it's, it's grace through faith, and the faith's not yourself. It's the gift of God, so it's all God. But the second one is also, I think, encouraging that there are unsaved sheep out there who will respond. That's the glorious thing of a sovereign God is when you proclaim the gospel, you can be certain that there are some that are going to respond to you because the Spirit of God is working in their heart to draw them in, to believe. John chapter 10, 14 to 16. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. But I have other sheep that are not from the sheep pen. I will bring them in also. I must bring them in also. And they will listen to my voice. And then there will be one flock and one shepherd. So it is the power of Christ that makes the dead to live. And if we believe that God has the power to break down walls and to give new life, and if there are those who will respond, then why then do we not go boldly into our community? Why do we hesitate to take the words of life. I think there are two, two things. The one might be apathy. 
where I asked earlier the question, do we really care? The question might be deep down, not so much. I mean, that might be the ugly truth that we have to look at, that we really, you know, we, we like the idea of salvation. We want to see everybody come to know Jesus. We want to see people minister to, but we just don't want to be the ones to do it. So the question then we have to ask is, do we really care? Or are we just apathetic about it? And that, that's a, nobody wants to have to consider that. And I'm not accusing anyone of anything, but it's just, it's a reality we have to look at if we're going to be honest. We have to at least consider it. We've got to be honest with ourselves enough to say, man, if you could see my heart, you would see I don't care all that much. The second one might be fear. This was a popular one, I think. We let the growls and the howls of the wolves scare us off. You, know, you, you take the gospel into the world. You, you start talking about you're a Christian and all of these preconceived ideas come and you, you, know, you get verbally attacked sometimes. You get made to feel like you're dumb, like you are marginalized, that you have no voice. <clears throat> and so we get, we get afraid of that. But also we're intimidated by the sheep in wolves' clothing. We get intimidated by those who aren't Christians because we have to understand that people who are not yet saved, but who will be once we proclaim the gospel to them, they can be just as ferocious as the actual wolves in sheep's clothing or the wolves in wolves' clothing. The wolves. We have to remember that God is the one who sorts it out. And we just have to be obedient. But too often, I think we settle for living among ourselves and being content with staying where it's safe. But that's disobedience. It's just disobedience. So again, do we really care whether they live or not? Are we content to stay inside where it's safe rather than risk it among those who are resistant to the faith? Martin Luther was quoted uh, by um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his book, Life Together. And Martin Luther just pulls no punches. He just, he just puts it out there. So you might not like Martin Luther after I share this quote with you. Um, but that's okay, he's dead, so he doesn't care. But um, he said, the kingdom is to be in the midst of your enemies. And he who will not suffer this does not want to be the kingdom of Christ. He wants to be among friends, to sit among roses and lilies, not with the bad people, but the devout people. Oh, you blasphemers and betrayers of Christ. If Christ had done what you were doing, who would ever have been spared? Can we get a collective, ouch, right? Harsh. We kind of ask, is it true? Not does it, does it sting? It's not does it, is it harsh? Is, is it real? Is it true? I have to tell you, I'm constantly challenged myself by Paul's attitude towards his own people in Romans chapter 9. Paul is very clear too. Paul can be brutal. Paul can be harsh. He can just, he puts it out there like it is. But then you hear him, <clears throat> excuse me, in Romans chapter 9 say, I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies to me through the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the benefit of my brothers and sisters, my own flesh and blood. He's talking about the Jews. <clears throat> they are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple service, and the promises. The ancestors are theirs, and from them by physical descent came the Christ, who is God over all, praised, uh, all praise forever. Amen. And then in chapter 10, verse 1, he says, Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God concerning them is for their salvation. Paul says, I would wish that myself could be accursed in their place. I wish that I could change places with them and I myself be condemned so that they could come to know Jesus. Man, do you love anybody that much? I mean, I'm just to throw the question out there, that's pretty intense. That's love and compassion. Do we care that much? Do we love the community around us in the way that Jesus loves the community around us? So whether or not you and I care enough right now 
Or maybe we do care and we just don't know what to do. We don't know where to start. I want to provide some food for thought and just see what the Spirit of God does with it. Just see if the Holy Spirit lights a fire within us. Because again, we can talk about all this and, and just we'll just go and enjoy our days and not worry about it. But what if the Spirit of God really wants to do something in us? And what if, what if it was prophetic that God called Jonathan to come up here and let's pray on our knees because that's where it's going to happen. Where we are, we are before him, maybe not even on our knees, Jonathan, but on our faces. And we're just calling out to him. Because I think the most important thing that we can do starts, continues, and ends with prayer. If God is the one who does it, then we have to make sure that we are in tight communion with him. So we don't limit our calling to praying. And that's the thing that we have to remember. We don't limit our calling to praying, but we certainly better start there and then undergird everything else that we do with it. And so when I ask you this question, have you come to the conclusion that when you're honest, you really, really don't care enough to act, to do something? And here's the thing that we have to do if we come to that realization. We need to repent. We just need to repent before the Lord. God, I just, I don't care. And I know that you do, and you call me to follow you. You've commissioned me as your child. And, and here I'm saying, I, I really, I care about me more than I care about anybody else. And what I need to do is just get on my knees, get on my face and repent before him. You say, God, I can't do this. I don't have enough faith right now. And the faith that I have, I'm not exercising it. I see it, I know it, I believe, but I don't want to do it. I just don't want to do it. And maybe I just need to get before God and say, God, would you do it in me? Would you get me up and move me? But would you, would you forgive me for being so callous and so self-focused? When the Spirit of God dwells in me, how can I have any excuse? How can I have anything that says, David, you know, really, in the end, it's all about you. It's really about your comfort. Because last I checked, it was really about my holiness. And so if I'm not about my holiness, then I need to repent. I need to start by repenting before God because I've forsaken my calling. And the only proper response for rebellion or disobedience is repentance. So, so we start there. But then we ask God, Lord, break our hearts for the people. If I don't care like I should, like, like I want to, God, would you just break my heart? I can't seem to break my own heart. I can't seem to get past what I see. I can't see what's the reality of the dry bones walking around me that are headed and, and hell-bent for a destiny apart from you. Would you break my heart? Would you give me the ability to understand this? Lord, give me a bigger heart for my community than I currently have. Lord, give me a holy dissatisfaction with the condition of the world around me. I want you to consider the words of a man named John Elias who saw his homeland of Wales in 1841 like this. He's talking about the people around him. He says, they walk in darkness without knowing whether they, whither they go. And the ministry leaves them in that condition. Oh, how sad. God, no doubt, is hiding himself. There is strength, light, and warmth wherever his gracious presence is found. Oh, that he would return to us for his namesake. Oh, that he would turn to revive us. We have deserved this on account of our great iniquities. But he can visit us in his grace. Oh, that I might see one gracious and powerful divine visitation in Angsley before I sleep in death. Do we dare pray this for Chattanooga and for Hickson? God, that I could see a great revival, that I could see a great awakening of dead people coming alive in front of my very eyes as you move before I die. And God, use me like you used Ezekiel to make it happen. Lord, give us divine opportunities to bless our community in the name of Jesus. Lord, give me boldness to live my faith out loud, caring enough to meet the needs in hopes of an opportunity to share my faith. Even Paul asked the Ephesian church, hey, pray for me that I'll have boldness. 
Pray for me that I'll have boldness. So if Paul had that, that need, if Paul needed people to pray for, then, then how much more do we need it? Or at least as much do we need it? Lord, grant me faith to know that you will save some who hear the gospel that we proclaim. So we will proclaim it with boldness, broadly and widely, and leave the results to you. So we pray, but then we also, we actively look for ways in which our faith family can engage and bless the community around us. We have to, we have to want our eyes open to be able to see. And, and in verse two, God put him and put Ezekiel in the bones and he led him around through them. I wonder if we need to just begin to move around the people and spend time walking among the bones. Maybe, I don't know what that looks like for you or for a group. Maybe that's a prayer walk. Maybe you just, it's like, hey, let's get out in the community and let's just pray for our community. Let's pray that we can start seeing the community as it is, as the mission field that it is. Maybe it's just being observant where you're going about every day. Maybe you're going to work and you just, Lord, would you give me eyes to see this building, this workplace that I'm in as a mission field that is full of dead people that need to hear the gospel, that need the impact of Jesus in their lives. Another possibility, another uh, uh, idea is to train yourself to actively and intentionally begin seeing your world through gospel-colored glasses. It, it, it means, I'm saying intentionality, so, so you pray it, but you also say, I'm going to start doing this. I want to intentionally remind myself that when I go into this room, there are people who don't know Jesus. I want to see that. I want to begin to see them as recipients of the gospel. Man, I, oh man I'm preaching to me. All right, John chapter 4, 35 to 38. Don't you say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Listen to what I'm telling you. Open your eyes and look at the fields because they're ready for the harvest. They're ready. When you go for a walk in your neighborhood and you walk the dog around the neighborhood like we do, do you ever just walk by the houses and go, who's inside there? What's going on in their lives? This morning, there, I didn't realize this, I kept hearing this truck engine outside our window. It was up at about 5.30 and, and so I kept hearing this truck and at one point I heard it start to, whir, 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 you know, and so I looked out and I saw that it was an ambulance driving by and I thought, Oh, man, wow. So I looked. There's a place you can go that Joey Velo's told me about where you can see all of the EMS calls and stuff that's going on. And I realized it was three houses down from me. There's somebody down there. I don't know. But they were taken in an ambulance. It's like, do, do, I, do I care? Do I care to even get to know who, who's in that house? It's convicting, actually. Do, do, what condition are they in right now? There's so many questions that come up. And what do we do as a response to that? Do we wait until it is in the worst possible circumstance? Or do we realize, you know, the, man, the harvest is white. It is ripe. So I want to encourage you to think outside the box. We need to consider how we as a church can better engage our community together as well as individually. And the, another thing is that we need to build margin into our lives. We need to build margin into our lives and our schedules so that we'll be able to serve our community. We can't do everything, but we can do something if we're intentional about making room in our schedule for community engagement. We get so busy, we don't have enough time to do anything. Maybe we need to start saying no to some things to be able to free up some time and space in our lives for intentional ministry. I want to encourage you to do that. And if we can't, and we're too busy for this, and we're probably busier than God intends for us to be. Two more things. One is to strategically leverage those things that we're already involved in for the gospel and to join others within our faith family to be in involved as possible. Invite some friends and go do something. It's just gospel-centered and ministry-focused. Summer makes for a lot of activities in our community. Get involved when possible or start something in the community. And the other thing ties in with that, and that is maybe our J groups work together in order to reach the communities in which they're planted for the gospel. Our J group has been talking about ways this summer that we're planted in the Valley Brook area, and everybody so far in our J group is within about two miles. And so how can we strategically minister the community around us? 
to be a missional community, to be a missional journey group, not just a group that gets together because we need each other, but to realize that our community needs us because we are the hands and the feet of Jesus in the world. So are we going to do it? And I don't know the answer to that question. I don't, I'm, I'm left just kind of going, Spirit of God, what are you going to do? But I know at the very least, at the very least, we need to be broken before him. We need to be broken before him. We need to be on our knees. We need to be on our faces before God. Maybe it's collectively as a church saying, God, we have not been real. I mean, that's, that's the thing is that we haven't been real intentional about, about our community. And that, that's self-focused, it's selfish, it's, it's ungodly. It's not the church. So I want you to bow your heads with me, if you will. Just right where you are. And I don't know what God wants to do even in these just couple of minutes. But since we've already had the example before us, and if God is doing something in you and you just need to, just to, to repent before him, Lord, I'm, I've just not taken your calling very seriously. I just haven't really cared. But Lord, I want to. I really want to. Then I want to encourage you, man, just to, you can drop to your knees if you want. Just bow in prayer where you are. Just really try to do business with God right now. Just ask him to, to renew within you a spirit that loves him, that believes him, and is ready to act on that. And man, I, I, am, I am with you on my knees because I need Jesus to forgive me for not being what I've been called to be in our community not leading our church in this very area of caring about our community around us for us to be the church in the world. Father, we are in desperate need of you. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you will break us of anything in us that needs to be broken so that we never approach you or the world around us with a hard heart, but with soft, tender hearts that loves people the way Jesus does, that cares about the community the way Jesus does that we will be intentional about getting outside these doors, not waiting for you to send people in here, which you do, and we're grateful for that, Lord, but, but you told us to go and tell. So, Father, I pray for me personally that you will forgive me for my weakness and failure in this area. And I pray, Lord God, that you will restore us as necessary. And do whatever you need to within our church, Lord, that will make us love our community better. And to have eyes to see as the Spirit sees. I thank you for working in this service today, Lord, in, in, in a tangible way. And I pray, God, that as we move forward, Lord, You would stop us from growing in complacency. And instead, we will begin moving with urgency, with the gospel and for the glory of Jesus. Amen. You may be somebody here who has realized that you've never really trusted in Jesus. And if that's the case, I really want to encourage you to grab somebody and to talk. Don't really grab them because that's you get you in trouble. But go to somebody and just... Say, hey, can we chat for a little bit? 
because there's something about this gospel thing that resonated with me, and I'd love to know more about it. Um, but I want to encourage us as a church to begin to really talk among ourselves and to really begin to say, how can God use us in Hickson specifically in the greater Chattanooga area to make a difference with the gospel for the glory of God, for the kingdom of God? I feel like we have no excuse. And so, so I want to encourage you to begin talking in your journey groups, be talking to small groups around you. We talk about everything. Well, let's talk about how we can, how maybe as a church we can do that. We can get involved in our church. So um, I just leave that with you. That is the fourth part of your homework assignment that I gave you last week. So it's also to engage each other in order to engage the community.